Hi, this is Alan Olson, and welcome to American Dreams. My guest today is Jim Quick. Jim, welcome to today's show. Alan, so good to be here. Thank you, everybody who's joining us. So, Jim, you know, for the listeners, you have quite a remarkable story, a story that as, as you've journeyed through life, nothing was ever easy, and it... Um, it started back when you're in your younger years. You grew up with suffering a traumatic head injury and became known uh, as an individual with a broken brain. I don't know if that's a fair statement, but yeah, can you give your story to us so we can better understand what you went through? Sure. My my quest for on this path for brain optimization and accelerated learning came really from my inspiration was my desperation. When I was five years old in kindergarten class, I took an unfortunate fall headfirst into a iron grate radiator, rushed to the emergency room, and there was a recovery there, but where it really showed up my life as a child was learning difficulties. So uh, I had processing issues. Teachers didn't really understand how to deal with me. I, they would repeat themselves over and over again. My parents would also, and I would eventually learn to pretend to understand, but I didn't really understand. I had memory issues, focus issues. Uh, took me a few years longer to learn how to read than all the other s children. And uh, you know, when I was nine, I had a defining moment where I was, I was slowing down in the class and I was being teased pretty harshly for it by the other children. And the teacher came to my defense. Uh, but all I remember, she pointed to me in front of the whole class and said, you know, basically leave this kid alone. He has the broken brain. And Adults have to be very careful with their external words because they become often a child's internal words. So I, I just said, oh, I didn't know I had a broken brain. And every time I did badly on a quiz or in school, on a test, exam, wasn't picked for sports, and this was pretty much all the time, I would always say, oh, because I have the broken brain. And so my struggles uh, kept, it kept on going. Every single day I would work hard. Uh, it came from immigrant parents, and so that part of the you know, the discipline, the culture, hard work ethic it was there, but I just, I would work harder, but not get the results as everybody else. And I just thought it was a little bit, um, demotivating. It was a little bit, uh, I was, I doubted myself a lot, felt like it was a little bit unfair. And it wasn't until I was 18 that I discovered a, a mentor and books and I learned a little bit more about brain science and adult learning theory, multiple intelligence theory. Um, I started studying ancient mnemonics. I wanted to find out, I'm very curious, like how does my brain work so I could work my brain? How does my memory work so I can work my memory better? And I realized that it's not how smart you are, or how smart your spouse is, or how smart your kids are, or how smart your team is. It's more, how are they smart? How am I smart? And I realized that if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. And I thought it was interesting in school that it often teaches you what to learn, math, history, science, Spanish, but there weren't a whole lot of classes on how to learn those things. There, there was no class called concentration or, or problem solving or critical thinking or memory, you know, even. And I always thought it should have been the fourth R in school, reading, writing, arithmetic, but what about, what about remembering? Right. Socrates said there is no learning without remembering. So I started studying those subjects, you know, really an area called meta learning, the art and science of learning how to learn. And when I did, I just, my grades shot up and, uh, and I started with that passion. I couldn't help but help other people because I actually felt a little bit embarrassed and actually a little upset that I wasn't taught these things earlier. And I started to tutor. And one of my very first students, she was, I remember she, like it was yesterday, she, she was a freshman in college and she read 30 books in 30 days. Now I, I know how she did it because I taught her some advanced uh, reading comprehension, speed reading uh, techniques, but I wanted to know why. I'm very curious why some people follow through and implement uh, what they learn and other people don't. And I found out that her motivation was her mother. Her mother was diagnosed with cancer. Doctors gave her mom only a couple months to live, maybe 60 days, and the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life, and well, health, wellness, medicine, and fast forward six months, I get a call from this young lady, and she's crying and crying, uh, and when I find out that they're tears of joy, Ellen, and I, her mother not only survived, but is really getting better. Doctors don't know how or why they were calling it a miracle, but her mother attributed 100% to the great advice she got from her daughter who learned it from all these books. 
And that's when I learned and I really ingrained in, in my mind and my, my spirit that if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. If knowledge is power. We hear that all the time. Then learning is our superpower. And it's a power we all have. And it just wasn't taught in school. And this is not a slight against teachers. My mother became a special education teacher early on to help me with my learning challenges. Um, you know, I have educators in my, in my family, but it's just the system hasn't changed a whole lot. Like you and I were talking before we started recording about the world and disruptive technology. And, you know, uh, you know, we live in a world of autonomous electric cars, right? Spaceships that are going to Mars, but our vehicle of choice often when it comes to learning and education is more equated to the vehicle of a horse and buggy. It hasn't improved as much as like our classrooms haven't changed as much as the world has changed. And so my passion and my mission the past three decades, uh, nonstop, full-time, past 30 plus years, is to build better, brighter brains. You know, no brain left behind. And it happens in our, you know, how does it show up? It shows up in our podcast. Uh, it shows up in the, the books that I write. It shows up in, on, you know, we have an online academy with students in every nation in the world, 195, you know, uh, countries. And that's, that's really the mission, show people really the limitless potential they have between their ears. So this is a fresh look at, at, you know, coming into a world of constant change where people are saying, you know, hey, how do I adjust? Mm -hmm. um, what do you do as a brain coach? So just like any coach, a coach is somebody who takes you from your current state to a desired state in an effective, enjoyable, maybe enjoyable process because they can fast track you because having a coach, uh, just like a personal trainer, a personal trainer, you, if you have one, it would, they're there to get your body in shape. They want to make you, your muscles stronger. They want to make you more pliable, more flexible, uh, greater endurance, greater levels of energy and agility. Well, I want your mental muscles to be stronger. I want your, your memory to be sharper, your focus to, uh, have greater endurance, your ability to think. And, uh, and that's what we do. We, we train people's mental muscles. Uh, we want to increase their, their brain fitness, if you will, uh, so they could not only catch up, but they could keep up and get ahead. All your listeners, it's not like it was 100 years ago, it, you know, we're agricultural age, industrial age. It, back, back then, it was like your muscle power. That was your worth. And, but today's your mind power. It's, but it's, not, it's no longer your, your brute strength as a hunter-gatherer. It's your brain strength. And, and so I believe we live in the millennium of the mind. And the faster you can learn, the faster you could earn. And that's, that's what I do. And so we take an approach um, where we take, you know, the new, the latest neuroscience applied towards learning and performance and productivity. We also draw on ancient wisdom. Like I wanted to, when I first learned these, I got very curious. I wanted to find out what did people do before technology, before there were, you know, uh, computers, before there were even printing presses, how did people memorize information and, and recall it. And so I started studying the ancient Greeks. What did they do a couple of thousand years ago to be able to be uh, pass on history, uh, to be able to be a great orator. And so, um, we put it together in, in the work that we do and we take a more of a whole self approach. It's not just left brain, right brain, but it's your three different brains, your conscious, your unconscious, it's your sleep. Uh, the best of brain food, stress management, and, and so much more. So there, there's, I realize there's no magic pill. Everybody wants to take like a limitless pill <laughs> to fix their, their memory or their focus. But I realize that there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's no such thing as a good or bad brain. There's a trained brain and an untrained brain. The challenge is sometimes with technology, and I love technology. It allows this, you and I, to connect like this and uh, to us to inspire, to empower, to educate, uh, to entertain. Um, and also if we're too dependent on technology, then maybe we don't have to use our mental muscles as much anymore than if somebody just took uh, their car to go to the post office, uh, you know, to five blocks instead of using their body, or they take uh, an elevator to go up uh, three floors to their apartment. They don't have to get the exercise on the stairs. So I, I think that there's, there's a balance there. Now, Jim, it, it, you know, when I'm hearing what you're walking through about learning and how people learn, uh, my experience in life is that there's different, um, different approaches to learning. For example, I'm a visual learner. Um, I'll often have dreams that will give me the wisdom and direction that I need uh, to overcome and solve problems. 
when you're working with people, uh, do you identify their gifts and their learning style yeah. uh, as you adjust to the process? So it's, uh, it's interesting. I mentioned that school, they teach you what to learn, math, history, science, Spanish, but not necessarily how, how to learn those things. I think a, a superpower is self-awareness, having the curiosity to know yourself. And then the other part of success and fulfillment, I feel like not only having the curiosity to know yourself, but also having the courage to be yourself also as well. So many people go into uh, talk therapy, they journal, they, they self-reflect and they build their intrapersonal intelligence, their self to self intelligence and IQ. Um, and then they also, you know, the other part is expressing that to the world. Uh, in, in Limitless, for example, we have, it's full of assessments in terms of primary learning styles, preferred learning styles, uh, multiple intelligence theory. And so uh, assessments based on the work of Har Howard Gardner out of Harvard University, basically saying things like IQ is, is a little bit out outdated metric for somebody's potential and their gifts that you could, it, the idea that you take a test when you're eight years old and that's uh, your kind of your fixed potential when you're 88 years old and everywhere in between is not really set because even if you look at standardized tests here in the US, if you look at things like uh, the SATs, it was testing for, for only two forms of intelligence, really, primarily. There was math, right, logic, and the other part was verbal, uh, linguistic. But there's so many other different forms of how people show up in the world, how genius uh, shows up, meaning somebody could have great kinesthetic intelligence, they're an incredible athlete or choreographer, musical intelligence, um, also visual spatial intelligence, the great artists, graphic artists, architects, if you will, interpersonal intelligence, people like yourself who are just, uh, who are just this natural charisma, they could connect with, with, with strangers very quickly and, um, and, in, and have greater influence, like uh, which might show up in sales or and then forms of leadership. And no, nobody's any one thing. Um, so there's different multiple intelligence. So we have all those different assessments in our work, including um, my book, Limitless, and people could just take those assessments and get some um, wisdom in terms of how they work their best. Again, not how smart they are, but how are they smart specifically? So have you found that individuals with ADHD learn differently from other people? I, I take a very strength-based approach to, and so I'm not trying to necessarily fix anything I don't, I don't think i think how people show up in their unique gifts is unique and just like every superhero you know and not everybody is a wonder woman or a captain america or so, some people have different superpowers some are super fast they're super accurate with their their bow and arrow if you will it's interesting when you look at nature and you're modeling mother nature every creature has a superpower some could fly some could climb some could breathe underwater some are super fast or super strong Human beings, interesting that we're not any of those things naturally, but we, because our superpower lies between our ears, right? Our, our brain, we can do all those things. We can fly because of the mind. We can uh, breathe underwater. We can be super fast or strong. And, um, and I believe the future belongs to those creators in a, in a world where a lot of opportunities being outsourced uh, or going to machines, uh, artificial intelligence, automation, what's not going to as easily uh, be outsourced is you know, in our careers or opportunities is truly what's limitless. There's no limit to our creativity. There's no a limit to our ability to solve problems. There's no limit to our imagination, our ability to come together also, also as well. And so you know, I, I, to live in a world that's diverse, neuro and diversity, um, where everybody is acknowledged, where it's, you could have a strength-based um, approach to things like ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, um, as you know, in, you, you know, it's almost cliche, but we, we all know leaders who are achieving in, in areas of athletics or commerce and, and um, in business that have, uh, that grew up with dyslexia or ADHD and it forced them to see the world in a different way. And they come up with different uh, behaviors and uh, solutions uh, than, than others. And so I, I like to encourage, I think it's finding out who, who we are and how we work and then, and then developing those those strengths and then creating a team around us, you know, a learning organization, um, just like, uh, like superheroes come together. You know, it's really great to see Marvel and DC, uh, Batman have their movie and Wonder Woman have their movie. And, you know, but when they came together as the justice league or they come together as the, uh, the Avengers, and then they're, they become an, a pretty inspiring, uh, 
unstoppable force of nature. I think you just answered, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. So how would you help someone that struggles to make decisions? So it's interesting. Choices are everything, right? The decisions that we make every single day in mean, one way of looking at it is our life is a sum total of all the decisions we've made up to this point, right? You know, where we're going to put our focus, where we're going to live, who we're going to spend time with, where we're going to eat, you know, when we're going to go to sleep, all these little decisions add up to big decisions um, and habits in our life. And I believe first you create your habits and your habits create you and that every decision we make is not only what you're going to do, it's who you're going to be at that moment, you know, in terms of our identity. I would say that um, there's a quote in my, in my book, Limitless, from a French philosopher that says, life is the C between B and D. Let's break that down. Life is C, the letter C, between the letters B and D. And B stands for birth. D stands for the other side, death. Life, C, choice, right? So the decisions that we make, and I believe that these difficult times, they could define us. These difficult times can distract us. These difficult times can diminish us or these difficult times can develop us. Ultimately, we decide. Uh, the challenge is, is, you know, school teaches not only what to learn um, as opposed to how to learn, but it also teaches what to think as opposed to how to think. And this area of metacognition, learning how to learn or thinking about our own thinking, I think becomes more paramount in a world that's in constant flux, disruption and transformation and change, right? Our ability to learn, to unlearn, to relearn something is, is, is a superpower because if you can learn how to learn and learn how to think and focus and concentrate, retain, implement, you could apply that towards any uh, subject matter, math, money, marketing, management, martial arts, Mandarin, you know, everything in your life gets easier when you can learn how to learn, learn how to think. Um, and we're not given frameworks even to how to make a good decision. And so that, that's interesting also as well. So in our podcast, again, or in our book, we give different models and frameworks, frames of mind, if you will, to make a good decision. Uh, one of them I highlight there is uh, Six Thinking Hats. And this is uh, credited by, created by Edward de Bono. That basically the idea here, and I'm oversimplifying, is that let's think about a decision or a dilemma that we're facing, some kind of difficulty, right? Most people get stuck because and with insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result because they're looking at it from the same point of view. And so Six Thinking Hats, for instance, gives you an opportunity to do a thought experiment. Imagine you're sitting, and I, I encourage everyone to try this even right now as you're listening to this, and in front of you maybe is laid out six hats of six different colors. And now you're, you're presented with this situation. You need to make a decision. And uh, the challenge is look at these hats and let's, let's reach out and grab, let's say the white hat and just imagine you're putting on the white hat and the white hat allows you, you could only see this situation, this problem, this dilemma through the eyes of logic. And just as a memory aid, because I'm a memory coach, imagine like a, a scientist white coat, right? And so you can only look at it through data. And so you're looking at the situation, just looking at the facts you know, through, uh, through what's being presented in front of you. And then, so you see the world through a different way. And some people exclusively look at the, the world like that, right? But it, it's a narrow lens. And so if you, for example, take off the white hat and grab the red hat and put it on, now you can't see things as, as data. You have to see things based on how it feels to you or your intuition. If you're looking at this situation, should I be in this relationship? Should I pursue this opportunity? Um, how do, how do things feel? You know, and this is the red is like the heart, the emotional hat. And so you can only, uh, siphon and filter through, through your emotions. And then you can take off the red hat and you can see where this is going. You can put on the, the yellow hat and that's the oppor that's the, uh, optimism hat. And that's like, what's the upside to this venture, to this investment? What are all the things that could go right? Right. And you take it off, you can put on the black hat, which, uh, optimism is kind of like the yellow sun as a memory aid, the black. Uh, hat could be the uh, the robes of a judge, and now this is the critic, and you're looking at the situation as what's the downside? You know how if you're ri risk adverse, what could go wrong here? And so you're looking at that, and then and you go it goes on and on. The green hat is the one of like maybe the third opportunity. It's green like grass; it grows. And so what? Maybe it's not between this or this. Maybe there's a third uh, new idea, right? Something that's that's more creative uh, path uh, that we haven't explored yet. And then the blue hat is interesting, and I'm oversimplifying this, is kind of like 
the blue sky. It listens to all the other hats and it's kind of like the manager. It listens and then it, it takes all that information and then makes a more uh, a vivid, more accurate decision because it got to see things from different perspectives. And so the idea here is sometimes you have to go to know. We, we do an annual brain performance, uh, brain health fitness uh, conference, and we had Quincy Jones there a few years back, and we brought him on stage unplanned, and I just asked him all these questions. And I, one of the questions was, uh, you know, you know you're, you're 80-something years old. Every, everyone knows all the Grammys and the Oscars and Thriller and We Are the World. What were the problems? You know, I want to know what, 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 kind of, what, are you, what are you facing right now? What are the problems? And he said, Jim, I, have, I don't have any problems. I'm like, all, we all have problems. What? He's like, no, I have puzzles. And I was like, ooh, interesting. That, that's an interesting filter because puzzles, it means there's a, it's fun, right? Who, like, who doesn't love a challenge? There's a solution there. And then we're talking about language learning a little bit and travel. And uh, Quincy uh, has, is pretty proficient in like 20 something plus languages. And there's a correlation between that and then the music uh, and that, that part of your brain, music and movement and language learning. And he said this phrase, like, you have to, Jim, you have to go to know. When I go from a different place and I'm in a different culture, it's a different food, different love, different languaging, different thinking patterns, uh, you know, different art. And it gives you, and gives you a different perspective. And so when we change uh, the place or the people that we're spending time with, uh, we often get to see the world in a different uh, point of view, a different light, and that allows us to have a, a more vivid representation of the situation. And in game theory, whoever has the most flexibility and options will will generally win, right? All other things being equal. And when you have a, you have more options because you see the world and you cut it up in in different ways. I think as if you're a great financial investor, you know they they have certain things that they they see the world uh, through mental models that other people don't somebody is extremely healthy or they have a great relationship. And it might be unconscious also as well. You know, my message for people is that genius leaves clues, that if somebody is exceptional in some area, any area of their life, then there's a method behind what looks like magic. When I go in front of an audience and I memorize 100 people's names as they pass around a microphone and introduce themselves or they challenge me to memorize 100 random words or 100 digit number, I always tell people, I don't do this to impress you. I do this more to express to you what's possible because the truth is, we could all do this and a whole lot more. We just weren't taught, right? And you know, with my challenges, it's interesting that through struggles, these you know, with learning was a struggle, it became a strength. And through challenge comes comes change. And so I think that life is hard for one or two reasons. Life is hard because we're either leaving our comfort zone, right? We're challenging ourselves in different ways, or life is hard because we're staying in our comfort zone. <laughs> And uh, I think we have to just choose, choose our heart every single day, you know, and it goes back to the power of one little decision. So I want to, this is all very, very good. And of course, we want people to read your book, Limitless. We'll put a, a, con a connection to that in the, um, in the transcript there so they can get it on Amazon. Is that where your main distribution channel is or where? You can get anywhere where, where books are sold. It's in, it's in dozens there of languages. Go. Globally, and we, we donate a hundred percent of the profits to charity, you know, and so we, we built schools in Guatemala, Kenya, uh, Ghana, uh, fully funded, uh, healthcare, clean water for the kids. Also Alzheimer's research and memory and my, my grandmother who passed of, uh, dementia. So last question here, top suggestions to help someone increase their productivity. Absolutely. And so, um, one of the things I would say is that. First, we create our habits, and then our habits create us, right? And I would suggest that a lot of our habits are unconscious. There are studies done at Duke University and other places where you know, upwards of 40% or more of the things that we do is just, uh, just on autopilot. And when did we actually sit down and design you know, those behaviors, those routines, those rituals, those habits, if you will? I think if you want to, someone wants to like, win the day and be more productive, then they have to win that first hour of the day. So how you start your day and win the day is how you win the, you know, really starts in that first morning. Uh, for me, I do this little thought experiment. I don't think it's about doing everything. And I, don't, I really don't think it's about time management. We hear that a lot. I think it's more about energy management, environment management, uh, priority management. A lot of people are very busy, but they're not productive, right? And so priority management is the maxim I use is that the most important thing is to keep the most important thing, the most important thing, right? That, that, that's, that's, that's your goal. And for me, when I wake up, 
most people grab their phones, which is the most unproductive thing that they could do because they're rewiring their brain and that when you first wake up, you're very relaxed and very suggestible. You're rewiring your brain for distraction. First of all, every like, share, comment, cat video, ring, ding, ping is driving you to distraction. Why, and you wonder why you can't focus in meetings or focus at school. It's also rewiring your brain to be reactive, meaning that you get one message, social media, text message, voicemail, phone call, email, and it could hijack your whole day. And it puts you in the defense. And I would say leadership, right, is being proactive. And how can you start your day by being reactive and training that muscle and flexing that? And it's going to show up in life. Um, so I would say instead of doing that, just do a quick thought experiment. Use the power of your mind, your imagination, right? Einstein said imagination is more powerful than knowledge. I do this thought experiment when I wake, first wake up and I would say, okay, I'm fast forwarding to the end of the day. And somebody asked me as I'm winding down, how was your day? And I say, wow, it was awesome. I crushed it today. Today was incredible. Then I say, okay, what had to happen in order for me to feel that way? You know, what maybe three things personally or three things professionally, or maybe both, what six things, if you will, happen during the day. And I just focus on those things because I think that with a growing to-do list, um, you know, a lot of people finish the day and they have more things on their to-do list than, than, than then when they started the day. And I think again, that if you could have that, that idea, I have a friend named Clay, he calls it a champagne moment in sports, you know, exactly when you're going to break open that champagne and celebrate, but do we have that in our day? Right. And so that's kind of our true North. I think a lot of people are burnt out, not because they're doing too much. Maybe you're burnt out because you're doing too little of the things that light you up, that make you feel alive, the things that really matter most. And so I would start my day in a way, instead of being reactive and distracted, um, something a little bit more thoughtful and, and begin as uh, Dr. Stephen Covey talks about in Seven Habits, Highly Effective People, begin with the end in mind. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you being with us today. Alan, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Been busy here today with Jim Quick as he authored Limitless and, uh, and uh, get his book there on Amazon, or we'll put a link to the website where you can go ahead and get- Can, uh, I, can I challenge everybody, Alan, to do something really quick? I, absolutely. I think, I think knowledge by itself is not power. We hear it a lot. I think it has the potential to be power, but knowledge times action equals power. And I think one of the best ways to learn faster is to teach it to somebody else. And I really appreciate your show and how you show up. And when we first met, in person, I would, I would challenge everyone to take a screenshot, something very, a small, simple step everyone could do. Take a screenshot of this episode, wherever you're listening to it and consuming it and post it on social media and tag Alan, tag myself. Mine is just at Jim Quick. You just have to spell it right, K-W-I-K. -K. And, and share one thing that you're going to do for a better brain, a better, brighter brain. Maybe it's going to, you're going to prioritize your sleep today. Maybe you're going to take a 15 minute walk with the dog. You know, maybe you're going to do a little bit of reading because, uh, you know, you read to succeed. If somebody has decades of experience, you like yourself and you put it into a book like you did and somebody could sit down and read that book in a few days, you could download decades in a days. So share, you know, maybe, you know, as a community, because we how do we become limitless in a limited world? We do it together um, and share it and post it, tag us so we get to see it. And I'll actually repost some of my favorites. And I'll actually gift uh, three copies of Limitless uh, to, uh, to your listeners just at, randomly, just as a thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.